Hi, and welcome to the Making It in Academia podcast series, where we're talking to former Cambridge postdocs who have made the move to a lectureship or PR position, and senior staff members recruiting into these roles. I'm Anne Ford, one of the University of Cambridge Career Service team working with postdocs. In this episode, I talk to a lecturer at UCL whose research is multidisciplinary, including material science, physics, engineering, and chemistry. We hear how former Cambridge postdoc Muchiba Abdi Jalabi's profile attracted UCL not only uh, on his research track record, but UCL faculty could see he would open new collaborative avenues for them. Muchiba shares how he looked for an institution that not only appreciated his research, but reflected his research-led teaching interests and his passions for enterprise and outreach. Starting a lectureship months before the coronavirus pandemic wasn't ideal, but we hear how he coped, the great institutional support he got, and if you stay till the end, much about reflects on surviving the heartbreak of academic job application rejections. And much about you're very welcome to our podcast today. And I just want to confirm your career path. So you graduated from the Sharif University of Technology in Tehran, uh, Iran in yep. 2012 with a bachelor's in material science and engineering. And then you received your master's in material science and engineering from uh, École Polytechnique uh, Fédérale de la Sainte in Switzerland. Mm-hmm. And then you did your PhD at the Cavendish Lab at the University of Cambridge. And then you uh, went on after that to get a junior research fellowship uh, at Wilson yep. College where I was very interested and something we'll pick up in our conversation that you uh, set up a spin-out company to develop energy harvesting devices based on emerging semiconductors. You have established your research group in UCL in 2020 and your research aims to develop and incorporate new inexpensive materials in optoelectronic devices to alter the energy landscape uh, by reducing both the cost of energy production and consumption. So I can't think of much that's more relevant or so pertinent <laughs> at the moment. It sounds like it's going well. So we wanted to kind of start just with the career motivations. What attracted you to a long-term academic career? Because it looked like you would have lots of options outside academia too. Sure, sure. Uh, first of all, thanks very much for the very nice introduction. And I want to say hello to, uh, to the audience. It's, it's my great pleasure to be here and share some of my experiences during the, during the way, in, in my way into the academic uh, career. So yes, uh, my, my first passion and interest was, um, in, was in research. So I, I really love research, doing research. And in particular, I, I'm, I'm very much like to do independent research where I can um, sort of make some impacts, particularly to address global challenges in energy, in sustainability and in, in healthcare. I want to, again, I want to pursue my own research interests, particularly independently. I'm also uh, sort of interested in, in teaching in, in, at higher education. And in particular, like the research supervision and uh, teaching uh, like master students, PhD students um, to pursue their, uh, their own research project and guide them along the way. So that was sort of my interest uh, that um, make me to go for a long, long term career in academia. Okay, great. Well, it sounds like you definitely are the right person with all those interests. In terms of lectureships, where you were looking for something that has a um, strong element of research and teaching, rather than, um, you know, some, some lectureships maybe have more of one or the other. Was that important to you to have both? Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. It was indeed important for me to cover both sides, but obviously I, I'm more into the research. Um, and, in, and in terms of teaching, I'm more interested in the research-based teaching. Uh, all, I mean, uh, that includes teaching of lectures, which are having some research elements in them. So um, that, w- that was actually one of the aspects um, of, uh, for my search into different sort of universities uh, to look where is the best or best institution to to work with and yes I mean all these days all the academic careers involve some sort of teaching so that's definitely the case 
uh, it's just a matter, uh, so, some of them includes like more than, more teaching than they say, and some of them includes more research. So, but yeah, in, in my case, I, I was looking for the ones with more research. You mentioned that you wanted to be research-based. So was that obvious in the ad, or did you do some behind-the-scenes investigation to find out departments in your field that might have undergraduates or, or master's students that need to be taught in that way? Sure. So basically, the one um, the institute that I'm at the moment there. So it, it's it's like like an institute for material discovery. So it's it's only has on uh, MSc or master's students and PhDs. Uh, so basically, we don't have any undergrads. So that that's a good sign that uh, you don't need to teach uh, a lot, and also you don't need to teach sort of very fundamental courses. Um, so basically, in the master level, it's mostly research led teaching. And also, um, it's involved a lot of research supervisions. So that was one of the criteria that I was looking at. Um, obviously, in, in not in all institutions, this is the this is an option. But yeah, it, it, it's uh, it's uh, it's one of it was it was one of my uh, sort of criteria. Great. So your work is considered multidisciplinary. How did that affect the kind of departments you looked at? Uh, any advice on that? Sure, sure. So yes, indeed. Uh, I mean, my as you mentioned uh, in the introduction, my background is material science in bachelor and master, and I did my PhD in physics and also fellowship in physics. And I did a lot of collaboration a- along uh, along the way with uh, electrical engineering or other sciences like chemistry. So it's 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 very multidisciplinary. So that's actually it's very helpful because it broadened the the, the sort of pool of host institution that you can basically apply and normally uh, I mean for me it was the case that I normally look at the capability of the institution um, to host my research uh, and what sort of uh, facilities or what sort of uh, potential collaboration that that institution can bring to my research so that was the thing that I was looking applying for academic jobs yeah, if I want to give a very short answer, so yes, multidisciplinary research is indeed helpful to to find a, an academic career. Yeah, it opens more doors because you're so adaptable. Did you have to though work hard to then understand the culture of the individual departments you applied to, so it then adapt your um, application materials and um, depending on what they were looking for? Yes, this is a very good point. In fact, so um, I mean the application definitely need to be tailored based on the uh, the needs and also the capacity of the host institution. So uh, yes, indeed, I, I did change my applications and try to highlight the capacity and capability that I have, which suit the job specification. This is a very good point that uh, uh, sometimes many applicants miss this. I mean, I have this experience to sit in a lot of interview panels in, in the past two years during my uh, involvement in the uh, Institute for Material Discovery. We interviewed uh, a few lectureship positions as well as uh, RA. And I mean, that, that was the key things that we were looking for. So to see that the applicant was keen enough to look at our website, to uh, get some uh, to to understand what what facilities we have, what what are the capabilities our host our, our, we as a host can offer, and how they can use that in their benefits to pursue their research. So this is very important. That uh, anyone who wants to uh, look for a job, they need to tailor their application based on the capabilities and the needs, and also the job specifications. And some people say to us, oh, it's a lot of work, but I would, <laughs> you say it's worth the effort. It really shows when you're reading those applications. Yeah, it, it does. It, it's, it's very important. So it, it, it makes the applicants appealing. Uh, first, we look at the many applications. So the ones who tailor their application based on this, those are the ones we uh, shortlist for the interviews. So it's, it's definitely worth the effort. Yeah. If, if they want the job. So it, yeah, exactly. if they don't well, want the job. <laughs> but I think if you're going to do the trouble, it's always work to apply for a job. So you might as well either decide you're going to do it properly or say, I want to apply for that job and I'll wait till I have the time and do it. So was there anything did you hear afterwards or realize at the time that was particularly attractive to the Institute in UCL about your experience? Anything? Mm-hmm. 
Right. So I think it was a mix mixture of uh, some elements. So, but but I can I can prioritize which one was more important. So basically, in 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 my case, it was mostly the research in strengths. So that was the first things. Then the uh, multidisciplinary aspects of my research and the way that I did a lot of collaboration. So that the monastery that I am a person who who can do the collaboration who can uh, sort of bring some new networks to the to UCL. Uh, the other aspect was the possibility of operation, I, I, I call it. So it's the way that my research can be done at, at UCL, at that in particular institute. So uh, that was another factor. Um, and the other thing was the relevancy of my research to the goals or to the vision of that host institution. So basically, um, my research was in aligned with uh, with their goals and their their very possibility for collaboration. So that, that's a very good point. I want to emphasize on that. So basically, when I'm in, uh, when I'm looking at from the panel point of view, so it's indeed very important that the candidate demonstrate that their research or their uh, capability can bring a new avenue for collaboration within that, that institute or I mean within the that department and also within the UCL or or even other institutions. So that, that's very important. So that's a very key things that we normally look for it. The other thing was the enterprise experience and also the outreach experience. So that's another thing that we normally look at to see if the candidates only it's like a one dimensional candidate or they, they can do uh, multi aspects. So not only focus on their research, but also they can do some outreach some sort of engagement with the general audience to do some further impact. So these are also some other factors which uh, help me to get this position. It sounds like you're an all rounder. And uh, having founded a spin out company, that was, you know, pretty early in your career, wasn't it? Was that something that was particularly attractive given the nature of your research? It's so, you know, uh, relevant, I think, to the world. Is that something that they picked up on the spin out company? Yes, yes, that's definitely. So that was one of the uh, sort of uh, things that the panels liked quite quite a lot because that shows that um, the applicants or myself had this uh, capability to um, translate their research into uh, a real impact. So uh, that's a very that is indeed a very good demonstration that this is the case. And the other aspect of it was the. Um, the capability of the applicants to deliver enterprise-led teaching. So okay. that is another, another aspect that most of the universities at the moment are trying to implement this enterprise-led or research-led teaching and into their educational system. And indeed, the students are becoming more and more interested in enterprise and in, in research, uh, rather than just learning some uh, theories in, in, the, <laughs> in the book. So um, yeah, this, this was one of the key aspects that shows, first of all, um, demonstration that my research has some impacts that can be translated to uh, a spin outs and some uh, as a potential for a real, uh, real world application. And secondly, that uh, shows the applicant's capability on the um, on the enterprise-led teaching. So they can bring this new sort of experience into their teaching style, in, into their teaching materials, and give the students some real-world case studies. So can you give me an example of a, a lecture, a module, enterprise-led? Sure. So um, basically, uh, when I joined UCL, I, I developed a new module. Uh, which was on real-world applications and exploitation of advanced materials. Mm -hmm. So again, because the institute that I'm involved in is mostly MSc students, so they want to see some translational, mostly case studies of the, the science that they, they, they have learned in the past. So basically, yes. So the, I mean, the, 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 the modules that we are developing as per the new guidelines is they need to have some aspects of exploitation or translation or to bringing some entrepreneurial mindset to the students. So th this is uh, some sort of very new guidelines that we get uh, in when we want to develop a new module wow. for, yeah, for students. <laughs> <laughs> that is impressive that you have to do that too. Uh, and it's brilliant to I me. Mean, it sounds like you really are the right person to teach uh, those students.
well, much of it has really carved out teaching which matches his research and entrepreneurial experience, as well as making the most of his multidisciplinary research experience. Stay listening to hear how much of it coped as a new lecture as the pandemic struck, what help was available, experience you can build now, and how to cope with the inevitable heartbreak of job application rejections. So I wanted to know, because you started your position last year, what was it like starting during the pandemic or just before the pandemic? And did it affect any, you know, your application or settling into the job and getting to know people? Right. So, yeah, the, very good point. So um, so I, I, I secured the job before, just before the pandemic started. So that was, uh, I was fortunate. But yes, uh, when when I started the job, so a few months the pandemic, a few months afterwards the pandemic starts. So it was indeed very challenging because my sort of research is mostly experimental. So I need to access the lab, and my re- <clears throat> my research students and um, staff needs needs uh, experimental. So therefore, it was very challenging at the beginning. And also the the other the other challenging part was the teaching aspects because mostly most of the teaching transferred to the online teaching, and we had to bring all the contents of the teaching from in person to online. So that's that's a different way of uh, teaching. That means an extra load of teaching uh, in compared to the normal scenario, which is about thirty percent of our our sort of time. And also the other aspect or challenging parts was the funding competition. So basically it become more and more competitive because <clears throat> people had more time to write grant applications. Good point, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> so uh, yes, the, these, these were the three most challenging parts that I faced. And But I mean, I, I tried to address them by uh, implementing some sort of approaches. Like, I mean, we, ha- we had some negotiation with the UCL team that give us some uh, lab access um, with obviously taking care of all the uh, safety precautions um, and also try to get some help from the senior members who can and also UCL provided a lot of um, help in terms of translating the, the teaching to online uh, platforms so that was quite helpful so and but it, it was quite a challenging years in the, in the past two years but yeah I think uh, it's, it's going to be fine again. <laughs> yeah, amazing. I'm just really impressed. But starting a, a lectureship is such a different job from a postdoc. I know you had your own funding and you obviously did a lot before, but it, it's a tough job to start and with all those extra challenges. So yeah, for current, so. yeah definitely. Now, I really uh, admire that. For current postdocs who, you know, we're not out of this pandemic and God knows what's in the future, but do you think there's any skills that they could learn now, maybe online teaching or developing resilience or kind of some robustness in their strategy that might help them applying for lectureships now? Yes, definitely. Very good point. So I think um, it, it's, it's first of all, it's very good to strengthen their CV and based on the new needs of the uh, this sort of lectureship positions, which is ability to teach online, ability to engage students, for instance, uh, while, while they're not in the class. Um, and we have a term uh, called connected learning frameworks at UCL. Uh, maybe this is the same in Cambridge as well. So basically, it, it's good to be familiar with this sort of uh, terms. And for, for a postdoc, my, my advice is to to try to strengthen their uh, different aspects of their sort of CV. So uh, not just only focusing on the research, but also getting some experience on the teaching, teaching supervision uh, in research and in, in, in like the module teaching lecture, lecture teaching, and also try to get some, if, if possible, if, if that's very depends on the discipline as well, but if possible, trying to get some um, experience in the enterprise aspects of the, their research and how they can create impacts and also uh, one, one point I forgot about the teaching so if they can get some qualifications on teaching that's very very helpful so for instance I know for uh, lectureship uh, one of the one of the aspects is the fellowship of higher uh, higher education higher academy of education FHEA so uh, if they can secure the, such a fellowship, so that that's that would be very helpful. 
and uh, that that make their applications appealing. Okay, great. And I think in Cambridge, there's quite a lot of support with their courses that kind of you can affiliate at the Cambridge Centre for Teaching and Learning that uh, can affiliate to the um, Education Academy. And there's definitely mm-hmm. lots of enterprise opportunities. Obviously, you need to have the idea and not just yeah. the opportunities. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think online teaching is something we, we will address and maybe in the live session that we're mm-hmm. going to do soon. So when we talk to people who are as successful, you know, in early stage career uh, as you are, much to uh, it can be a bit disheartening for people who think oh well my career isn't going so well do you did you ever feel like giving up or did things sometimes not always work out for you in terms of applying for things that uh, you've yeah, yeah. you know to encourage yeah. people yeah very good point so basically yes um so as as you might imagine acad- acad- academic sort of careers very competitive and uh, there will be a lot of challenging time such as this pandemic or <laughs> access to the experimental uh, labs and etc. So yes, there, there were a lot of, I mean, I, I myself uh, applied to many, many institutions before I secure my current job. So, okay. and uh, I got some rejection as well. So that, that's very normal, I, I would say. Um, so yes, at the beginning, it might be a bit hard when, when you just uh, um, comes out of your PDRA and try to apply for these jobs and get some rejections. Uh, and not being invited to the interview. So <laughs> this might be heartbreaking, but uh, yeah, I think what, what I can suggest to, to, to go against these sort of challenges is to, is to try to, to keep, keep changing or keep uh, their application, make, making it better and better over time uh, by trying to get as much as feedback as they can from their mentors, from the panelists, from the interview panelists, if they have been invited to interviews, and also um, trying to get advice from the career service. So that was one of the things which was very helpful actually for me. Uh, mock interview, uh, mock applications. So I think these are very helpful. I mean, it's, there, are, there are great resources available in, in, in Cambridge in, in other universities like UCL or et cetera. So um, it just, people just need to use them. So it just, and, and also they don't, they need to, um, yeah, as you mentioned, they need to, they need to create this resilience in in their in their search for the job academic jobs and they they need to not be disappointed after getting some rejection at the beginning um, so keep trying and keep improving the applications based on the feedbacks and more feedback the better feedbacks you get the better quality of the applications you can submit to the uh, host institution brilliant yeah I agree. And I think that's it's great. And it's good to hear it, you know, because um, when people are going through a phase of feeling not confident or having rejections that uh, even people who look on paper, like everything has worked out for them, have had those days and those periods. Thank you so much for your time today. It was really fun talking to you and best of luck with your research. It, it sounds amazing and everything else you do for the academic community. Thanks very much. It was my pleasure talking to you and hopefully this was useful and helpful for the postdocs and yeah, all the best for all, all the audience uh, for their next endeavors. Thank you. Well, much about his fantastic role model of a multi-dimensional academic who really found his niche in research, teaching and wider activities such as enterprise and outreach. His encouragement that with some support you can manage as a new lecturer in a pandemic and get through the inevitable rejection has inspired me and I hope you. That's it for me and Ford for today. Next up, the hidden insights on getting a lectureship from the recruiters of the academic world. Mm-hmm.